Um, when I was 12 years old, I tried to commit suicide by taking an overdose. Yeah, I, I, I came close to overdosing and dying a few times. It's very depressing to think that this was our home. Somebody just kept shooting. When the gunshot stopped, they all got up, but he didn't. Yes, I uh, came to Washington without anyone uh, who I knew and I've been living alone since then. I never use a condom or anything. I guess you could say I set myself up for it. Probably the most dangerous problem is probably uh, prejudice. It's real dangerous. We were telling him to slow down and he was scaring us, but we had no control over what he was doing. When you first come out here, the streets are so like addicting talking about the money and uh, the women, and I just found out that it wasn't true. When I left home at 14, uh, I was having a lot of conflict with my stepfather. The Hollywood Freeway is one of the first places I ever stayed. There was continuous tension under the bridge for everybody. It was a basic ritual every night. People come down and drink, shoot up, smoke crack, um, hang out for a little while until everything starts taking effect. It's not one person fighting and arguing, it's another. Street life got me involved in gang activity. Uh, a lot of crime, car thefts, muggings, burglaries. I wasn't taking care of myself. I was like doing drugs again. There were many nights that I thought I was going to die. I was afraid. Scary. You can't. You can't go through one day wondering if you're if you'll live the next to see tomorrow or or if you'll be able to eat tomorrow. It's probably the second dirtiest place that I stayed in. It's very depressing to think that this was our home. Just thinking about what, what we had to do to, to survive, I had to live out here. And also the regression of us went from, from, from a basically decent place to a dirtier place, to a dirtier place, to a dirtier place. You know, just going downhill week after week after week. We had nowhere to go but back to here. And we got into a shelter. And now um, we're doing well. I'm working. Where we've got a place to sleep. We are fed. You know, we have three meals a day. And um, things are just going a whole lot better for us now. I don't want to have to depend on anyone else. I mean, we need some help at first to get started and everything, but by the time the baby comes, I'm sure <laughs> we'll be able to be out on our own. I just want a good life for my baby and for, the, and for my family. Well, I grew up in... Uh Will Met, which is a north suburb of Chicago, and uh, it's a pretty sheltered area, um, really nice area, North Shore. Basically, I, I was pretty bored when I was a kid. I, I didn't have very many friends when I was in grade school. When I was a kid, I remember always taking sips off of my parents' beers or wine or whatever, and I always thought that was the adult thing to do. I started drinking a lot more which led to my pot use. And then once I did that, you know, I, I did coke, LSD, mushrooms, opium, all my freshman year in high school. You know, every, everybody drank, everybody did this, so I did it too. Acceptance. 
I came close to overdosing and dying a few times. My last arrest last fall was for dealing LSD. The whole time that I was in primary treatment, I, I lied my way through it. Just I, I told them what they wanted to hear because I had no intention of staying sober. And uh, I got into Parkside Youth Center and I was going to leave right away, but I had nowhere to go. So I just stayed there and uh, it gave me a lot of time to think about what I really wanted and if I really was having fun when I was using. And I decided that I wasn't really having fun. So I had to learn how to live my life all over again. I feel pretty good about where I'm at right now. I just uh, moved into an apartment. It's the first apartment I've ever had. Working here at the hospital is, is really neat because it's a real sober environment for me, which I need right now since I've been out of uh, Parkside Youth Center for two weeks. I, I used to be worried about what people thought about me. That's why I used a lot. But now, I, you know, if someone doesn't think maintenance work is, is good enough, well, that's their opinion. When you're using, you don't see yourself slipping. You don't see things, you don't see things bad happening to you as a standpoint of you causing it. You always think it's everybody else. But it, it doesn't have to get that bad. That's what I'd have to say to people. Don't let it happen. I don't know, I feel like I'm a different person. I understand a lot more and I, I see a lot more. I'm more cautious as to getting into a car with somebody ever again. I have to, I mean, I don't trust other people driving. He looked perfectly fine when I got into the car with him. So, but it was risk taking. I hadn't seen him drinking, but if I had used my common sense, <laughs> I would have known that he had been. He was going about 70 miles per hour around these curves, and it's real dangerous. We were telling him to slow down, and he was scaring us, but we had no control over what he was doing. And the next thing I know is we were spinning. We were in a spin, and we hit a telephone pole. But it hit on his side, but I got the impact and snapped my spine and I broke it. And then they had to rip my door off because they couldn't get me out of the car. And I just remember what kind of pain I was in. It was, I mean, it just was incredible pain. The moment that it hit me that I couldn't walk, I cried. I mean, it's just totally unbelievable. It's like a slap in the face, you know. I went through a lot of therapy, like five hours a day. It's like every single day, it was really hard. I still, as of today, have the physical pain constantly. I don't have my bladder or bowel back internally because the nerves, there's something wrong with the nerves. My balance is not very good. I I can just get, somebody touch me and I can fall over if I don't have any support. So I walk with a cane. If I hadn't had my mom there, I mean, it brought us a lot closer. And it's just, it's a struggle. It's a struggle that we both went through. What I could have done differently was not going car with him, but I could have found somebody else. I could have called my mom and had her pick me up. He could have, I guess, not drank. I mean, and he, he was trying to show off for another girl that he had liked. So I think that his ego got in the way of his common sense, and that's why he decided, well, I'm going to be cool, I'm going to race, I'm going to speak just to show off for this girl. And in the long run, in the end, <laughs> he wasn't being cool at all. He slipped up. Whenever I read in the newspaper or saw on television that someone's son was gunned down or cut up 
or just found dead for whatever the reason. It hurt for a little while because I thought that parent could be me, but then the pain would just sort of go away like I would forget, I guess, like everybody else. But this time it was different. It was me and the pain is real and it doesn't just go away. He said that's what it was. That's what the fight was about. Dancing while and bumping into each other. And they walked they walked across the street from the club to the Woody's parking lot. And they saw the guy that they was fighting again. And he asked them, was they looking for him? And he pulled out a gun, started waving it in their face. And they said when the gunshot started, they fell to the ground. And he did too. When the gunshot stopped, they all got up, but he didn't. He was the bright spot in our lives. I know Mark's problem was peer pressure. He wanted to be like everybody else around him. Mark mistake that night was being at that club because he was only 16 years old and he should have he should not have been allowed to go in there. He could have just leave. Mark could have just leave. I've often told him that it was easier to walk away from trouble than to stand the fight. It's dangerous out there for everyone at this point, but especially for young blacks. They, the, the young, the teenagers today don't have any respect for each other, for, the, for themselves. It's almost like it's a new generation of people and they just don't care about what other people feel. It's very scary. And it's painful, it's hard to sleep at night. Every noise you hear, you wonder if it has something to do with your kids. I'm 18 years old. I've been in the U.S. for one year and a half. I uh, came to Washington without anyone um, who I knew. Blanca was quite apprehensive, even from the time before she left home. But once she was on the road uh, with the person who had agreed to bring her, she got more and more nervous. During the passage from El Salvador to uh, the border with the U.S., um, the group stopped in Guatemala. And uh, according to what Blanca had heard, these coyotes tended to take advantage of the young women, especially those who were unaccompanied. And um, it so happened that Blanca was uh, assaulted by this man and the group um, actually helped in that process. Not in their family, not in their Firstly, family. what's been most difficult for me in coming here has been the lack of family, the lack of a place to, in which to stay. School is a good place for me to learn and to study, but I haven't made, I haven't gotten close to or made too many friends because I'm weary of uh, getting involved and getting disappointed once again. Coming to the U.S. has been much more difficult than I expected, um, primarily because I thought it would be very easy to get a job here and um, to, to work. Um, however, without knowing the language, it's very difficult to get a job. Through support and through my counselors at the Latin American Youth Center, um, people at school, I was able to overcome 
some pretty rough times. I try not to look back and to think about the negatives because um, then I would not be able to go on day to day. Most people call me RJ, and I'm from the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation. Mostly it's like drinking. A lot of parents drink and leave their children alone. <clears throat> Others, it's no jobs. There's no jobs on the reservation, so that's why you get a lot of Indians leaving the reservation. It extends even into um, it's down to the lower school grades, schools, lower school class, because It'll be like, they'll come to school. Oh, we had so much fun. We drank a lot this weekend, and we all got stoned and huffed gas. And my classroom, there's, it's, they've gotten into Satanism. They draw devil signs on themselves and pray to him and stuff. And, it, and because I didn't get involved with that, I, I was kind of like shunned as the nerd. Probably. The most dangerous problem is probably uh, prejudice. Because you, you find it <clears throat> in a lot of places. You'll be, there'll be people that, you know, you tell them you're a Native American, you won't get the job or something. Red man, chiefy, uh, savage, those kind of schoolboy names. Huh. It makes me want to hit them, but then I don't because well, I don't really care for fighting. <clears throat> my parents got divorced, and so that's kind of frustrating. I'm kind of angry at my father, but then proud of my mother because of the way she can support us so good without any help from my father. I need a good home. I need a loving family, a family that's close together. The next part of the session is a discussion of tunnel vision. That's what happens to people when they're feeling depressed, when they're feeling alone, when they're feeling suicidal. Now what you see there is basically what a person who's intent on suicide sees. They don't see the big picture. All they see is the grief and the pain they're experiencing. When I was 12 years old, I tried to commit suicide by taking an overdose of pills. Um, when I was nine, I was molested by my dad. Um, I grew up in a abusive home where my mom got beat in an alcoholic home where there was a lot of emotional and physical and sexual abuse. The fact is most people who want to commit suicide are actually undecided. Well, a little bit of me wanted part, to die. Part of them wants to die. A little bit wanted all people to understand that I really did need help. Yeah. I never did drugs. I had one friend that did drugs. She smoked pot a lot. And before I tried to commit suicide, like the day that I tried to commit suicide, she used my name to get drugs, and it got all over town that I was using them. And that was like my big breaker. I mean, that was the last straw. They go on living because of the people who do care about them, their friends, their family. All the friends I meet, and I realize I'm not alone. I mean, I'm not the only one with problems, and I'm not the only one that hurts. Everyone hurts. I'm not in an abusive home anymore. And now that we're out of my dad's home and stuff, we're allowed to laugh and allowed to have fun. And allowed to be ourselves before we had to be what he wanted us to be. I think that they should listen to teenagers more when they cry out for help, watch more for the signs, and give them a lot of love. That was really important, I think.